I was camping in our Pecos Wilderness during Memorial Weekend, having a great old time, and uh, got a call that my son was injured. The mission that, uh, that we were anticipating we were going to get uh, that day wasn't customary, it wasn't the, the type of mission that we, uh, we generally do. It was a very unique mission in the sense that it was a rare daylight raid. It was in an area um, that we did not have a lot of U.S. presence in, but we knew that it was an opportunity to strike hard against the enemy in an enemy network that was worth it. Well, I mean, we were all really pumped up about it because it seemed like there was going to be action happening. Uh, leading into the morning of the assault, we had a fix on the location of our targeted individual. Everybody had that same sense of we needed to get business done. We knew this was an opportunity and it was a fleeting target and this was the reason why we're going. We went out, we loaded on the helicopters. Um, I just remember the, uh, you know, usually you can't see the, uh, you know, the rangers faces because it's usually dark when we get in those things. And uh, you know, just the blank stares that was on everybody's face because that level of comfort we usually have when we go in at night I uh, just wasn't there. As soon as we landed, you know, we, we started to receive enemy contact. And as that was going on, Rangers do what, what Rangers do best. That's neutralize and destroy the enemy. To be able to look fear and danger right in the eyes and be able to say, hey, let's get ready to take care of business. There was actually a decision made to split the force, which kind of changed the dynamic of how we were going to assault the primary target. First squad was clearing another building, and I was in third squad at the time. And Sergeant Petrie was the weapons squad leader, and he was with us. Uh, Petrie was up there with, with that squad. Um, he was up there in charge of that element as they, they moved in. Many situations where we have troops in contact at close quarters like that, that are resolved very quickly. It was apparent from this one that this was, this was drawn out. This was different. There's no question about it. Me and Specialist Gather Cole were clearing underneath and uh, Sergeant Petrie and Robinson went back to clear the chicken coop and whatever was in the courtyard. So when we were down in the basement, we got the call that Sergeant Petrie and Robinson were both hit. We were actually back clearing into the compound and I remember seeing the guy out of my peripheral vision. Two guys with AKs at their hip just spraying and one happened to strike me right in the thighs, and I, I didn't know I was hitting both thighs, but it hit my left thigh, and I ran for cover, leading out in front of uh, uh, PFC Robinson, who was behind me, and he was struck right in his rib cage on his left side. I got out there first. Uh, I noticed that Petrie was shot through the legs, and Robinson was laid out on the ground, and I immediately took out a uh, tourniquet because I was going to throw that on Sergeant Petrie's legs. And then that's when a grenade came over the wall and that kind of blasted me and Robinson. And that's where I, I got knocked out. Sergeant Roberts and Specialist Gatherical came out and they started engaging those two guys that were throwing the grenade. And then Specialist Gatherical was shot. When I came in, the uh, the front door of this compound where they're at, you know, I, I see Staff Sergeant Roberts um, dragging another one of our guys into the, the back door. And there's like a trail of blood. He's all bloody all over his face. I said, you know, who's this? And he's like, it's Gator. I'm like, all right, what do we got? He's like, we got four eagles wounded. You know, they're getting them getting ready to put him on the litter. And I, I asked the medic, I said, hey doc, um, do we need to put his helmet on for uh, transport? At the same time, it was Sergeant Bates, our company senior medic, looked up at me and just kind of went, like, hey, this guy's not gonna make it. When I turned around and another grenade was pretty much right behind me and Robinson. And we were looking this way, shooting at this guy and the grenade landed right there, and Sergeant Petrie lunged for it. He grabbed it and was throwing it around the wall, and I saw it go off. And then he came back and, you know, his hand was gone. 
I could tell you that what kind of went through my mind, and if I could kind of show you with the prosthetic that I have, yeah, it, uh, this thing comes off, but uh, it was literally just cut right off at the wrist. There was a little bit of a meat skirt, so to speak, for lack of better words, uh, hanging around the edges, and uh, it was oozing. I could see the radius and the ulna bone sticking up maybe about a half an inch. It was vivid where I could see the black marks from where it burns were and a uh, little bit of the dirt and the smell of still uh, explosives. And I sat up and I grabbed it. And it's a little strange, but this is what went into my mind was, why isn't this thing spraying off into the wind like in Hollywood? And then right away just caught back to reality. Oh crap, got to put a tourniquet on it which we keep tourniquets on the outside of our kit. And I grabbed that and I was able to uh, tie it down and because of the good medic training that I got when I was going through the courses, but um, stopped the bleeding. As I was running between the two buildings, um, Sergeant Petrie himself called me up on the radio and said, my hand is gone. And I said, I, I'm on my way. First guy that ran up to me was a uh, first sergeant. He ran toward me and I said, he grabbed me in an attempt to say, hey, come on, we're gonna get you out of here. And I said, no, you're not, you're not gonna take me anywhere till you kill those guys and stop the uh, volume of fire they're laying down on us. Just the fact that he was still throwing grenades at the enemy, like, I mean, that's awesome right there. The younger guys next to me were kind of still in shock and awe. So maintaining control, maintaining awareness, trying to remain calm so that they stay calm. Radioed up the status and, hey, you guys okay? And uh, just making sure that uh, staying in control of the situation. Really, when I went back and I, I looked at what happened, like, I think he saved my life twice, really. You know, definitely with the grenade that was behind me. It is very awe-inspiring when you hear a, a, about a guy that doesn't think about it, you know, and it goes back to that same thing that I would say, you know, in our creed, never leaving a fallen comrade. You know, to be in a position where, you know, you're, you're kind of pinned down, you're receiving direct fire, you're under, you know, uh, attack from enemy grenades, and uh, when you're faced with a situation that's dangerous like that, that, that a ranger will take his safety, put it aside, and execute without even action, without any guidance, to save two other rangers. That, that is very powerful. Finally, the service of Leroy Petrie speaks to the very essence of America. That spirit that says no matter how hard the journey, no matter how steep the climb, we don't quit. We don't give up. Leroy lost a hand and those wounds in his legs sometimes make it hard for him to stand. But he pushes on and even joined his fellow rangers for a grueling 20-mile march. He could have focused only on his own recovery, but today he helps care for other wounded warriors, inspiring them with his example. Given his wounds, he could have retired from the Army with honor, but he chose to re-enlist. This is the stuff of which heroes are made. This is the strength, the devotion that makes our troops the pride of every American. And this is the reason that, like a soldier named Leroy Petrie, America doesn't simply endure, we emerge from our trials stronger, more confident, with our eyes fixed on the future. Our heroes are all around us, saluting one of those heroes, Leroy Petrie. When you say hero, I think of all the men out there giving their lives and their, their families being behind them 100%. But he had that character in him to help other people. And that's what he did. He cared about other people. So at the time, what he did, he knew, I think he was really, like he had told me before, Dad, I was doing my job. I was taking care of my fellow soldiers.
Thank you. Dr. Wilkins, staff, distinguished visitors, uh, it's, thank you for this opportunity to come here and speak with you. It's, uh, it's truly my privilege. And um, Colonel Fickey, thank you for being here with me as well. Um, it's, it's easy for me to be here. Um, I, I really want to thank Colonel Fickey for being here. He's, uh, his role, his job is really important. It's helped me. It's helped so many other soldiers. And it's uh, truly my honor to be here with him, taking away from his busy schedule. I know there's a patient, a friend of mine, waiting for him to get back to work. So, so I know how important his job is. Um, a lot of what I want to, you guys saw the uh, presentation or the video, and it's, it's great. I, I came back, and it's because of people like Colonel Fickey that, that uh, my life has been positive since after the incident of losing my hand. The prosthetics, the care, all the medical treatments I've received have been phenomenal. And that's, that's one thing that I love is along the way, I, I rehabbed with so many wounded soldiers and to see their resilience and to see their smiles and to get past those little milestones of their traumatic injuries, some with missing both leg, limbs, some multiple limbs, that's, uh, that truly uplifts my heart. And I see it in my job. I, I was going to get out of the military. Like, like the president said, I could have retired. Could have made a lot more money than in the military. But I, I looked at the opportunity to stay in, and I said, there's this job opening where I could be a liaison for wounded soldiers. And I've been through that process. I want to help them get through their portion of it. And it was something that I said I could give back and I could still keep doing more. I said, those jobs on the outside are always going to be there. Now's my time to continue serving. I want to continue to do it. Um, a lot of people will look at kind of my bio and say, well, he's been on six deployments to Afghanistan, two to Iraq. Wow, I can't believe eight deployments. I look at that as it's hard to, when people say that, I, I immediately respond to them. I tell them, a lot of my peers are on their 14th deployment of, overseas. So I've missed out on a few. I'm actually uh, trying to catch up with them here in a, in a few weeks. But um, when I lost the hand, I, I, I knew I was going to possibly have a hook. And I was OK with that. I actually do have a hook, which came in great at Halloween. But um, <laughs> I, was, I was a pirate. <laughs> and, uh, but the, the innovations and the technology, the, uh, they gave me a hand. And I said, well, I could, that's OK. I could, do, I could do all right with that. And there's multiple attachments that I have. I know Colonel Finke still wants to see my cutlery set. I got a full set of knives for the kitchen. <laughs> and uh, I was amazed by the technology and what they, how well they took care of soldiers that they have an array of tools. They have, even have a two-foot golfing or a fishing rod you can put on the end. The hand comes off. And, just plug it in, go out there and sink a lunker, I guess. But uh, it's, uh, it's been nice. It's, been, uh, it's opened doors for me as well, having lost the hand, because I had never played golf. And they told me they had an attachment for golf. I was like, Ab absolutely, time to pick up a new sport. My uh, three-point shot's not going to be that good anymore in the basketball court, so got to play something with the kids. And it's, it's been uh, one of those ways where I can still continue on keeping a normal life. And uh, I know a lot of soldiers go through the depression. For me, it was sort of the same way. I, it was, uh, I knew what I was going to do. I, I wanted to be a ranger the whole, my entire career. I wanted to keep going, jumping out of planes, rappelling out of hel helicopters, shooting and moving, leading guys, kicking down doors, and making an impact. And all of a sudden, here I am, at, at thinking I'm at the top of the world, and like the majority of people, thinking I'm invincible. And I tell a lot of people, unless that hand grenade was made out of kryptonite, I'm not. But um, that, that's where my life 
hit a brick wall. And I said, well, what am I going to do now? I'm missing a hand, my legs, missing a lot of meat in between it on the thighs. And I said, I could either try and keep climbing over this wall and not make it, or I could go around the wall and find a new path. And that's kind of what I did. I, I got directed on a new route of life. I, I love it. It's uh, rewarding. Every time I see one of these injured soldiers come back, some that have lost their, their legs, and they, as they progress through the stages, they start to walk on their new prosthetics. It's like watching one of my own children walk across the living room floor, and it's uh, really, really inspiring. So I, I love that portion of it. My family, they, at first, they had a hard time dealing with it. They, uh, I had a young, my daughter was about 10 at the time, and she didn't really understand it. She says, Dad, well, I can't believe they did this to you. Can't we sue those people? And I said, they're not around anymore, honey. <laughs> but, uh, but it was, uh, they, 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 got, they, they started adapting to it. And with the independence that the prosthetic has given me, I pretty much self-independent around the house. My wife was surprised when she first got down in the hospital in San Antonio to visit me. And she saw me there sitting up in bed shaving with my uh, left hand. She's like, what are you, why are you shaving? You're in the hospital. I, I said, because we still have a standard. What if Colonel walks in here or General? I don't want to get caught with a beard. And uh, that was one of my things. I had always wanted to join the military since I was about seven years old. And for me, it, it was an opportunity to uh, serve my country. I saw my grandparents, my relatives, with pictures of their, in their uniforms on the wall. And although they never really talked about their service too much, I knew that they had pride in their service. and. They, when they would talk to their friends that were also in the fellow veterans, they, they, I said, wow. And then I learned a little bit more about the military and what they were doing, uh, Desert Storm, Desert Shield. And my brother served only a four-year stint in the military, which uh, it wasn't for him. He was getting out when I was going into the military. And the military is not for everybody, but um, you, if you get pick something, if you're able to pick something that you love and you enjoy doing the job you're doing, and it's, it doesn't really become work, it, it's, it's enjoyment. I, uh, I always used to look at it that way. I was like, wow, athletes get paid just to uh, go play a sport. But then when I, I got to basic training, I was shooting, qualifying on the rifle, and, and I said, can I shoot some more ammo? I enjoy shooting. And that drill sergeant looked at me like I was crazy. He said, well, you got a ranger contract, don't you? And I said, yes. He said, well, you're going to shoot more ammunition than you ever wanted to. And the first time I get to my battalion and we're going out to the range, I had so much ammunition, I was getting tired of pulling the trigger. <laughs> but I, I didn't believe him. And it was a great opportunity, and it, it, it made me realize that there's a reason why we have so much ammunition and why we do so much together is because you train for the real thing, you train your best. And those, a lot of those guys in the video were, are still my Ranger family and military family across the board. And that's partly what a lot of people say, well, how'd you gather the courage to grab that grenade? I said, well, I look at those guys as my brothers or as my children. And if they were sitting here next to me and a grenade came in between us, I'd do absolutely the same thing. And it's, uh, e it's easy to do that when you uh, spend so much time together. And we, there's a lot of diversity in the, in the military, but everything gets left at the door. You're just there to, to do your job. And I think that's where everyone comes together. And to see my act, one action rewarded so highly seems kind of unfair to me when there's doctors out there like Colonel Fickey and others that are saving lives numerous times and uh, kind of go unspoken. And that's partly how I look at the receiving the medal is that it's not only mine, it belongs to every service member. 
especially those who gave the ultimate sacrifice. And one thing I love to do is, is uh, thank my veterans. I, I was born into a free country because of their service. So if there's any veterans in the audience, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's, all, it's my privilege to uh, be serving today because of what they've done. And they always say, well, thank you for your service. And I say, I'm only trying to carry the torch for a little ways, which I can until hopefully nobody had, it gets to its final destination and we're all at peace. But my wife wasn't too uh, happy with me when I decided February this year I was going to go back to Afghanistan for the first time since I had been injured. And she said, "Why? Well, you've already done your part. Why do you want to go back? I said, honey, there's still a lot to do over there and anything I could go over there and do to support the men and women on the ground, I'm, I'm all for it. She's like, well, what if something worse happens to you? I said, well, there's men and women over there with the same amount of risk. I don't have anything, I don't risk any more than they do. And it's, that's one of the things that she, she realized that how much it meant to me to still be in the military and still do what I can. And she finally said, okay, well, go have your fun. <laughs> and, uh, it's been nice though, but that's that's another part of the strength is the strength is the family that that supports you while you're deployed, and the friends and the families, and the prayers that you get out there. I always tell people I had a few miracles that day. I had both legs, th upper thighs shot through, didn't hit any bone, arteries, and I'm still walking on them today. And then to have the grenade go off so close and not kill me but not kill my other fellow soldiers was just a, a blessing. And every time you lose a soldier, it's, it, it hurts. But it, it doesn't hurt just the immediate family or, or the parents. It hurts anybody that, that they've ever come in contact in their entire life. It's the ripple effect. You drop a droplet of water and it touches everybody that's ever met that person. So a lot of people will also comment, well, how do you go around and speak to everybody? I say, because it's, it's an opportunity for me to represent everybody in the military. And it's a great story. I mean, if, if those two soldiers that were next to me, those rangers next to me, didn't have to feel the repercussions of the ripple effect and all their families and that, then it's done a lot more than just save two lives. It's saved a lot of grieving. And I am luckily here to be here with them because uh, I could have I been taken out that day too as well. Um, we were talking with a lot of med students, and I, I, always, uh, I always like to tell them that if there's, there's uh, remarkable doctors out there like Colonel Fickey that uh, eventually have to, don't have to, but choose to uh, take some time for their, themselves and their family at the end of their career, and we, there always needs to be somebody to step up. Infantry, there's lots of infantry. Doctors are far and few in between. So I say out of 100 med medical students, if even one joins the military and we get another Colonel Fickey to serve and uh, save lives, that's, that's remarkable. That's uh, one of the most humbling things I think somebody can do. They, he, I'm sure he's had the same choice to go work elsewhere for a lot more money, but you get to work on people that have either neglected themselves or were doing something they probably shouldn't have been doing and get injured, and you get to work on that person and save their life. But when you can save a soldier who is giving their life, then it, it means a little bit more. So I thank you again for that, sir. It's, uh, it's been tremendous in my life. And I just, uh, I look forward to uh, going back. I work with, uh, as a liaison for the wounded soldiers, and doing that small rotation overseas and just continuing to serve alongside the men and women of uniformed services, that's, that's my honor in continuing that. And I'm, it, I'm proud to have the privilege to do so. This used to be a free ticket out of the Army, but I look at it as a, a golden opportunity to keep going. And there's many others. I have a few buddies with missing limbs that are still continuing to fight overseas after losing a leg, four, four rotations without a leg, helicopter pilots missing a leg, um, 
I have a double leg amputee that works with me up at Fort Lewis, still in the Rangers as well. And that, that's, that inspires me to see all that stuff and to see them just going 100%. I never once ran into a wounded service member that had a bad attitude and, and that didn't say, I'd go back in a heartbeat. I'd go tomorrow if they asked me. But it wasn't to go back and get revenge for the damage to their bodies which they received. It was to go back and make a difference. And that's partly why I tell people I love, I love to go back overseas is I get to see the changes we're doing over there. I get it, I, I, my first rotation to uh, Afghanistan was in 2002. And my last one was in February of this year. So throughout six deployments, you get to see the roads being built, the schools being built, the smiles on the civilians' faces, them, all the help that we're doing and all the positive impacts we're doing. It's, it's remarkable. The, um, the kids that were five years old at the time we first stepped into that country are now 15. And whether this war continues in Afghanistan, another five, 10 years, whatever, those are gonna be the ones that are impacting the changes and saying, hey, we don't want the terrorists in our country. So I, that's the part I love and keeps me going back, is knowing that we're working toward a good progress. But it's, it's, a, it's one of the things I am extremely proud of is my service in the military and the support of my family. And it's been a truly a privilege to be here and speak with all of you today. Thank you for this opportunity. Rangers lead the way. Oh.